Okay, so <clears throat> uh, the title of my topic today is actually a question. Looking healthy, what does that entail? How are we influenced by media messages surrounding health and surrounding size? And that's the question I want to explore with you today. And to do that, we're going to first look at some of these images that we're confronted with almost on a daily basis that tell us something about what it means to be healthy, what it means to look healthy. So there's one trend you might recognize, um, the fit girls. Uh, they roam the web and we see them. And here, I think you see many instances, sometimes before and after pictures, but often focused on a very particular type of body, a female body, a muscular body, something that is perceived as both healthy and beautiful in today's current context here. Then you also have a lot of messages surrounding fit girls, but also uh, s separate from them, that concern food, the types of food that you need to be eating, kale, for example, which Dutch people know we have been eating for quite a long time. We've never considered it superfood, but now it is superfood, so yay for us, I guess. But also different types of shakes, um, uh, certain types of diets, such as the paleo diet, um, vegan diets, smoothies, avocado seems to be very hip uh, and happening today. I love avocado, so that's good for me. But these images also convey ideas about what it means to be healthy. So these are the ideal types of things that we encounter, and there are many, many more, of course. But we also have different types of messages that we're confronted with. Maybe you consider them the, po could consider them the polar opposite. And those are messages like these, and they very often focus on health in terms of size. So, for example, the Guardian um, headlines, obesity causes premature death, concludes study of studies. Um, the New York Times says obesity is linked to at least 13 types of cancer. Um, this was I'm not sure which source this was of. Obesity associated with earlier Alzheimer's disease onset. And this is a, a sort of a public health campaign from the United States saying portions have grown, so has type 2 diabetes, which can lead to amputations. Cut your portions, cut your risk. So these are all <coughs> different types of messages, but they also convey ideas about what it means to be healthy and what it means to not be healthy and to look healthy or not look healthy. And what I want to do today is something that might be a little bit different from what you're accustomed to, um, is I want to challenge you to together deconstruct some of these messages that we're getting and try to figure out what are the implicit ideas that we're getting about health and the implicit meanings in some of these mediatized messages and what can we learn from them. So, health is often constructed in terms of size and health is also seen as a biomedical issue. But what I want to do today is to look at health and size as social and political issues. Um, and I want to do that with you. So not just from my perspective, but also in interaction with you. And I think uh, one of the things we can start with is to look at a few of these uh, health promotion campaigns and see what we can learn from them. What are these implicit messages and sometimes also explicit messages about health and about size that we can find in them? So I hope this will work. Watch on YouTube. Um, so I have a little video. I'm going to just explain the context of this video. Um, and it is a health promotion campaign uh, from the United States focusing on uh, obesity and uh, getting the numbers of obese people down. And what I, want, uh, I would like you to do is to look at this and then I'll show you a few more uh, examples of similar campaigns but then uh, one from the UK and two from the Netherlands, which are actually print campaigns, so not videos. And um, I hope that after we've looked at all of these, we can kind of think through together uh, what kind of implicit ideas are there 
that maybe are not explicated, but that are, that are felt and that are communicated in different ways. So what are the implicit messages about fatness, about health? Do we have sound also? Okay, so this always happens, right? It works on your computer in your office, and then you come here, and it doesn't work. And everybody thinks, oh, this is this professor that can't handle technology. <laughs> Sorry, guys, just the reality. Everybody works really hard to get it to work, and we hope it does. Sorry about this. There is sound, it seems. Hey, there we go. So, so that's the first one. You might need to cancel that before it starts learning out the next YouTube thing. Yeah. Nay, nay. <laughs> Yes, okay, there we go. So that was a campaign from the, uh, from the US. This is one from the UK uh, that reads, warning, my fat may be funny to you, but it's killing me. Stop childhood obesity. And fat prevention begins at home and at the buffet line. Stop childhood obesity. Um, then there's one uh, from the Netherlands, which I will translate. It says, you decide what you eat yourself. Uh, and then small print, um, there are more and more people with overweight. Overweight means that you weigh more for your length than is good for your health. Make better choices with what you eat and prevent becoming overweight. And then there's this one. It says, uh, say no more often. Say no more often uh, to eating too much and exercising too little. Otherwise, in five years' time, about 20% of our children will be fat. So now my, my question to you is what stands out? What social constructions surrounding fatness and surrounding health that you notice in these messages? And just pop-up style, raise your hand or... It's bad to be fat. It's bad to be fat. That's a very clear one. Right, thank you. What else? Starts early on. Starts early on, yes. 
It's your fault, your own responsibility, yes. But uh, on the other hand, it's also your parents or society's responsibility. Yes. On the US and UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the parents who are responsible, but somehow you're also responsible yourself because it's presented as a choice, right? It's a choice. Yeah. You seem quite lazy if you're fat. Mm hmm. Fat people are lazy because they're breathing heavily and. Yeah. Lack of self control. Mm hmm. And where, where did you see that? Well, basically, in that the person kept eating and the Dutch slogan, which was like, say no more often, so it implies that you don't really control yourself, so mm -hmm. you just keep saying yes. Yes. Okay, very good. Anything else? Apparently, only fat people eat unhealthy. Mm hmm. It's about healthy lifestyles. So. Yeah. So, fat people are the the very the, much the target, right? There's no one else depicted in there that might also be eating unhealthily. Mm -hmm. To eating and to what else? No, yeah, exercising regime. So, the, the, there's a sort of a causal relationship that we get communicated, right? So, if you eat too much and you move too little, you will become fat. So basically all the fat people have done something wrong. They have eaten too much or exercised too little or both. Yeah. I also heard that it's also related to the market. That's the, I have friends that says that that's the, in Germany they are cheap. Mm -hmm. And also um, the mountains are too much. And that's why French want to get so fast because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. and the, the portion is so little. Yeah. And in UK it's also cheap and a lot. And also the availability of the food that's on the market is also a trick. Yeah, you saw that a little bit in the first video, right? Where, where there was a canteen displayed with all, this, all these choices, all these sort of choices that are presented as wrong choices. So you can have french fries, so you don't have to have your, uh, the, the food maybe you brought from home or something like that. So yeah, that's also an issue. So, so to quickly sum it up, some of the things that you mentioned and maybe also what, what I would add to that, is there's, there's a clear sense of risk and danger that's communicated in all these, uh, in all these uh, videos and, and also uh, photographs. You have to beware that you might become fat and that is dangerous because fat is bad, even to the extent that you might die from it. So you, there's a really felt sense of risk and danger. There's also the idea that fat people are irresponsible because they're making uh, the wrong lifestyle choices. So it's an option. You have a choice, apparently, to be or not be fat. And if you make the wrong one, it's your own fault because you're irresponsible. And so maybe you're also lazy. Um, and tragic. It's a bit presented as a bit tragic. And I, th I think um, the last um, image that I showed you from the Dutch commercial, you saw this big body and, and um, a, a baby's face. It looked really sad. And also the one um, from the UK saying, my fat may be funny to you, but it's killing me. So the idea of a tragedy there. Um, fat people are depicted as somehow worthless, not really um, co contributing anything to society, but, a, but somehow an economic burden by, for example, the healthcare costs that arise from overweight and obesity. This one is not very um, explicit in these messages, maybe, but, but it is communicated in, uh, if you look at them in opposition to, for example, the images of fit girls. You see that fatness is not presented as something that is um, appealing. This is also related to the issue of irris being irresponsible. So maybe you're, um, you're not smart enough to make the right choices, right? Or weak-willed, something that we discussed. Um, and this is what I, uh, what I mentioned before, the economic costs of being overweight are presented as a heavy burden on society. So if you look at all this, then I think these uh, constructions have very little to do with the biomedical framing of cause and effect, even if, for argument's sake, we would assume that um, obesity, overweight, or I like to say fatness because it's for me a more neutral term, um, that they cause ill health, then still it doesn't warrant all this. So what I think um, it adds to take a social and political perspective on this issue is that you can really see this becomes a moral issue by the meaning making surrounding 
fatness and obesity. Um, and what do I mean by that, a moral issue? It becomes about superiority and inferiority, about defining what is good and what is bad, and thereby also defining people in certain ways. Um, so the constructions of size as a lifestyle choice and a personal responsibility make blaming and shaming fat people seem like very legitimate things to do. And this is something I encountered in my own research uh, practice as well. Um, and this leads to inclusion of people who adhere to the norm by the way they look and exclusion of people who don't. And I'll show you some examples because I've done um, several research projects. I started out researching um, kids, high school aged kids, 12 to 18 year olds. And it was back in 2008 I started that project. And um, I don't know if you remember, but in 2008, 2009, we had this big Mexican flu scare. Um, so it was all about, oh my gosh, we're all going to die because we're going to have an epidemic of a flu that everybody is going to be very sick. And uh, it didn't happen, but anyways, we were scared for a bit about it happening. And in that time, I started asking these kids, what does being healthy mean to you? What does health mean to you? And it was so striking that amidst all this stuff about the Mexican flu, the first thing they all said to me is that you're not fat. It's like, what? That you're not fat. So I'll, I'll present you with two quotes from that research project. One girl, 15-year-old, said, I think it's really disgusting, all that fat. I really cannot understand how you can let yourself get this fat and not think, gee, let me go out for a run every day and do some sit-ups. That you can look like that and still continue eating is beyond me. So what I think is very clear in this quote is the moral condemnation of fat people and the idea that it is... Um, it is the result of certain lifestyle choices that people make. Whereas that is a very convoluted issue, to my opinion. But it's very striking how morally condemning she feels about fat people. And this is a boy, seven-year-old boy, who, who thought he, himself as being fat. And he said, eating the wrong things and being overweight is my own fault. I can blame someone else, but I am the one who ate that. So what I see here is the internalization of that blame and shame. So I did something wrong, and this is why I am wrong now. So I think you can see here the basis of the exclusionary practices surrounding this issue of size. So at the moment, I'm doing a different research project, which involves talking to people who self-identify as fat or overweight or obese or full-figured, whatever they want to call it. Um, and I'm asking them how their size matters in their everyday life. So in their work, but also going grocery shopping, going to see the doctor. What, what impact does it have on them? And I have two quotes from that research as well to present to you. So this, uh, this is uh, um, two quotes from women between the 30s and 50s. Um, the first one is, everywhere you look, on TV, in the newspapers, they are going on and on about it that you have to be healthy and that you have to be slender. And look in the stores too, the sizes go up to size 40, 42, and that's it. So it's made very clear, you just don't fit. You don't fit in the picture. And this other one, you just feel as a fat person, you have the idea that you're not allowed to be because you really just don't belong. You are just the one, well, how to explain? You don't count, you are dirty, fat, you smell those kinds of things. So you see here in this research project very clearly the effect that these constructions, these messages that we keep getting, sometimes implicitly without us even noticing, about what it means to be healthy and thus what it means to be good. Right? So these people feel like they're bad people. So this I think is the basis for these in and exclusionary practices. And you see it also in different aspects of their life coming back. So uh, from the Washington Post, even an extra five pounds can hurt your job chances. I have talked to people who have actually told me they were rejected for their jobs because of their size. They didn't get an internship because they were supposedly a high risk for sick leave, for example. But also in interaction with the medical establishment, I think this is a painfully funny uh, cartoon saying, person saying, doctor, I've been impaled, and then the doctor not even looking at them saying, well, maybe you'll feel better if you lose some weight. So this is what happens often um, of what, what I heard um, 
the people in my research project often talking about. If I go to the doctor, even for a sore throat or a sprained finger or whatever, the first thing they're going to tell me is you have to lose weight. Even if I think it's not at all related to what I'm presenting with. And some people even say that very serious medical conditions get underdiagnosed because the doctors can't see past this um, size issue. Not all doctors, obviously, but it does happen. So these are some of the social and political implications that I think are very important to highlight here. The in and exclusionary practices surrounding size, but also something that we don't talk about if we frame fatness as an individual issue is who benefits from this construction? What are the power structures that make this possible, right? That keep these ideas in place. And then we go to some of the usual suspects. The pharmaceutical industry obviously benefits. The fitness industry obviously benefits. The food industry wants to sell as many products, both light products and fatty products. Uh, the medical establishment with their whole area of weight loss, surgery, etc. But also sometimes governments, and this you might feel a little bit counterintuitive, like what do governments have to do with it? I don't know if you have the same construction where you come from, but here in the Netherlands we have our governments make us pay our own risk on our health insurance. So you have a certain amount of money that is your own risk, right? So you, before you get every, anything for free, you have to pay like, what is it, 400 euros about? And that is also, if you can let people accept that you, being healthy or not is your own choice, is something that you can control, is your own responsibility, then it makes it a hell of a lot easier for them to accept that they have to pay for their own costs instead of having a social environment which might be co-responsible for health issues. So the last thing I want to, um, I want to highlight here is what I call the magical qualities of fat. And I have to explain that a little bit because um, especially in the project where I worked with these uh, high school aged kids, they were constantly talking about fat and then I started questioning them. So what does it mean? What do you mean fat? Who is fat? And then they said, oh, you know. I said, no, I don't know. And then they said sometimes something like, you know, when your BMI is over, blah, de, blah. And then I said, oh, so you carry a scale and a tape measure everywhere you go and you make people stand on it to see if, if, you th if they're fat or not. They say, no, no, no. I look at them. So what do you look at? Well, I don't know. So fat has a certain quality that anybody can be called fat, also because it's sort of an, an unpolite, impolite word, sometimes maybe a swear word for some people. It can attach itself to anybody, basically. And also because of the idea that fat is scary, we all fear getting fat, or maybe I'm over-exaggerating here, but the fear of fatness is very widespread. So, for example, even animals in the zoo are being put on a diet because they're too fat. So the idea is very much ingrained in our society. And that word and the implication that it's something bad is spreading very fast. And my worry is what does this do to our ideas about health? Because we keep seeing health in terms of appearance and not in terms of how do I actually feel, right? So I think how we think about fatness, about size, affects basically everybody and not just the people who are most, maybe most affected by it, the fat people who get called out for it, uh, but also kids, young kids. Uh, I mean, I have two daughters. My eldest daughter started talking um, at four. Uh, first time I heard her say, Mom, I think I'm fat. I'm like, where do you pick that up? I don't even know if she meant what she was saying, but she, she knew it was a bad thing, right? So that, that is how these ideas get very much ingrained in people, and I think that's not a very positive thing. So for me, I have a few questions that I, I, I would like um, to maybe open the discussion with. Um, the question is how to move forward. And maybe you, I have some ideas, but maybe you also have some ideas, which I would love to hear about. So for me, it's very important to challenge and deconstruct these dominant notions about fatness, because I think they're harmful, basically. Um, 
And I also think that maybe we can use a little bit more empathy for marginalized people in marginalized positions. And I'm not only referring to people who are not slender, but also, for example, to women whose bodies are policed more than men's, to people with physical disabilities who cannot attain that norm regardless of anything, people with lower socioeconomic status who cannot afford to buy kale and to make uh, uh, spinach smoothies and eat avocado all day. So um, I think empathy is, is a way, maybe, to um, move forward on this issue. That was it. I hope to hear from you. Thank you very much for listening.